always thought they said, hi, Hitler. Yeah. You know, hi, <laughs> like, hello. My dad was on stage playing a German transvestite. Es ist ja ganz gleich. The theater was my home. I didn't want to be different. I wanted to be like the other kids. I wanted to get out of the pole circus. We're moving to New York. No, I'm not moving. I'm not moving to New York. <laughs> Here. That's a loft, ha <laughs> ha! I would also rehearse sounding more American. Do I want a bank of the pizza? Check a man, not a Coca-Cola. Everything about me was different again. Hey, German girl, you know why no one likes you. This is crazy, but let's be crazy and think about the consequences later. <gasps> okay. Lucy, thanks so much for being here. Ah, thank you. Thank you for blowing up my poster. You're welcome. <laughs> I did it myself. Uh, congratulations. Yep. This show, I think, is a few years in the making, right? When did you first sort of start workshopping it and staging it? Yeah, I started writing it in about 2013, at the end of 2013. And um, then it went through different incarnations. And in 2014, I took one version of it to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in Scotland. And that's kind of where it was kicked off into its real life. What, what did that version look like compared to the version that is now that you're performing at the Cherry Lane Theater, I believe, right? Yeah, that version was really shitty. Um, <laughs> no, it was just um, very bare bones because it's a fringe. It was a fringe production. So, you know, just a chair and me. And... Um, and it was a bit shorter. This version is about 70 minutes. And at the fringe, you can't go uh, past 60 minutes. That's kind of the, the rule there. So there's a little bit of added material and a little bit of added, um, yeah, you know, set design, a little bit of lighting. So it's a little fancier. And now this isn't, this isn't your first one-woman show, right? Or is this your first one-woman show? No, it was my first one-woman show. And then I wrote two more. Um, in 2015 and 2016. So 2015, I wrote a show called Cry Me a Liver, which um, is 10 different characters. It's kind of a love letter to New York. And then in 2016, I wrote A Pole Calypse Now, which is a pun <laughs> on my last name. I don't get it. No. Um, it's a pun, hello. Um, Bipolar, pole position. <laughs> what was it like going back to the, your first show and sort of recreating that and doing that over again after it feels like you've probably... It must have felt like you'd kind of moved on. You'd written two other shows since it. Yeah, I'm definitely very, like, um, ADD when it comes to, to writing shows. I don't want to uh, spend too much time on an old show. But this was great. I think it's also very timely because it's about um, my story of kind of searching for a place to belong. And I'm an immigrant. I was eight when we moved here from Germany. And so I thought that it, it felt really right to do it now just because I think it'll resonate with a lot of people on um, a lot of issues that are out there right now, as well as, of course, the comedy in it. And, you know, growing up in a crazy artsy family, I think, never goes out of style. But um, it felt good to revisit it. Yeah, it was... It's always fun to kind of let something lie and then look back at it and see how you've grown, you know. So, yeah, it's been good. Where did you immigrate to? New York City. What, like which borough? Where in the, Soho. Where? I grew in up so on, oh, you on grew Green up in Street. Soho. Yeah, on Green Street between Prince and Spring. That's where I grew up. So this used to be one of my old stomping grounds. This Tower Records? You this come up Tower here Records, buy, buy yeah. records? All the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's All the time. Cool. Mm -hmm. What is your process when it comes to sort of developing uh, your, your shows, like a one-person show? Do you sit and you write? Are you performing characters for yourself in your room? What, <laughs> what is your process? I talk to myself all the time. Uh, the process is that I usually need a deadline. And then uh, about two months before the deadline, I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, I have to write a show now. Uh, that sounds really unprofessional, but it's true. <laughs> deadlines are amazing. Deadlines help. Yeah, exactly. And then it depends. So with this show, I had somebody that I developed it with, uh, and he kind of pulled stories out of me and, you know, asked me questions. So it was kind of a collaboration. And then with Cry Me a Liver, the character show, yeah, I'd literally just go into a room and see what character would kind of come out. 
um, and see what would stick and then try it out and do like a 20 minute version, then a 30 minute version, invite some friends to come see it, you know, try out little bits at comedy clubs or, you know, like compilation shows. Um, and then, yeah, and somehow, you know, uh, the show must go on. So when that date finally arrives, somehow there's always something, you know, that ends up on ends stage. It yeah. <laughs> was called Hi Hitler. You immigrated from Germany. We have uh, yeah. Hasselhoff here, who is a, you know, a beloved pop star in, in Germany. My darling. Really? David. Well, yeah, I loved David Hasselhoff. Um, Why? A bit, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. No, I do know. Because I I was a tomboy as a little kid, a very little kid. I, I, I had, like, um, black teeth from eating too much candy. I had really bad teeth, and I was kind of chubby, and I had short hair, and everybody always thought I was a boy. So I kind of made it my mission to become more girly. And I had set my eye on this girly, girly, girly girl in my class, Nina. She was so girly. Her name actually means girl in Spanish, Nina. <laughs> That's how girly she was. And um, she was a big David Hasselhoff fan. So I committed fully to being Nina's best friend and also became a huge David Hasselhoff fan. My mother is a singer. And David Hasselhoff is famous in Germany for his singing, yeah, right? Not for Baywatch. People don't know this. For his singing. Also, but mainly for his singing, yeah. And my mother's a singer, and um, my parents would sleep in my room. There was a futon. They would roll it out at night, and they would sleep on that futon every night. And I wanted to put up a David Hasselhoff poster, and I did. And then my mom came and took it down. And she was like, I am not sleeping under that pervert's face. <laughs> And I was like, why? I love him. So I wasn't allowed to hang up a David Hasselhoff poster in my room. And I'll never forget this. She said, you know, in like two years, you won't even like him anymore. You'll be over him. And that was the day I swore to myself, to spite my mother, I would love him till the day I die. So even as an adult, you still love David Able Hasselhoff? Mom. Even yeah. now? I'm so committed to always and forever loving David Hasselhoff. David, I love you. As soon Where as you reached you? that age where you were no longer under your mother's thumb, did you put up a David Hasselhoff poster? And do, you, <laughs> do you still have it up? My whole house is covered in David Hasselhoff posters. Um, well, so. he's on my poster now, so. That's true. Yeah. And you say it's called Hi Hitler. You immigrated from Germany. You know, I'm sure by the time that you immigrated, I don't know how connected your family felt to Hitler in World War II in Germany. I'm, you know, a couple generations passed, I would imagine, but that stuff so, still sort of lingered. How much did your parents talk about that and talk about, you know, their parents and their parents' parents? Yeah, so I'm a German Jew. My mother's Jewish. Um, my father's German. And my parents are both artists and, you know, sort of intellectuals, you could say. So there was a lot of that actually, a lot of arguing about the war with their friends and arguing about who was in the resistance, who wasn't, you know. Um, There's that period of time in the in the mid 70s to the early 80s where West and East are still kind of combating each other and also discussing totally. the tenets of communism and fascism and what it means to becoming a, a, a Western capitalist nation. It's a really fascinating time for, for exactly. Germans. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So that's exactly what it was. And they were, you know, post-war kids. So they grew up um, very much in that discussion and, and kind of uh, fighting those demons and, and that past all the time. So it was always a discussion at our house and, and they would take us along wherever they went. So we grew up kind of falling asleep on, on a bench somewhere at like an, a, an event or a bar having those arguments like ringing in our ears, you know, while we we're kind of just like kids lying there. So Hitler was a name that came up a lot. Um, and I remember my mother used to put on The Great Dictator for me to cheer me up when I was a little kid. Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator. And so I always thought that he was this funny character that my parents would argue about. And I would doodle him. And my parents would laugh and all the adults would laugh, you know, and I'd doodle him holding up a peace sign. And I always thought he said, hi, Hitler. I, I always thought it was hi, Hitler, like hi, like a greeting, because I was a little kid. When I was four, I, I said to my mom, I want to be Hitler for carnival. <laughs> and my mom was like, uh, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> Maybe something else. She was like, you can be anything else you want to be. She's like, clearly you've missed the context of our conversations. <laughs> yeah. It's okay, though. Um, but for me, 
Uh, that's a joke and it's funny. At the same time, there's a lot that resonates in there for me in terms of my background and, you know, why I'm here. You know, um, the fact that my people on my mother's side and my father's side were displaced and the war had, you know, such a huge impact on their lives. Um, and so for me, hi, Hitler is also kind of like, hi, Hitler, we're still here, you know, we've made it and you couldn't get us down. So, yeah, I think, um, so that's what resonates for me in the title, uh, besides the joke, obviously, it's, it's funny. And now in, in your family, you have one of the most famous and well-known playwrights, poets, Bertolt Brecht, right? And was, uh, forgive me for uh, forgetting the timeline. Like I've read a number of Brecht's plays and I'm familiar with his sort of manifestos about theater, but he, was he during or just post World War II? Yes, just post. He died in 56, yeah. I believe, 56, yeah. So he had, um, Did he flee? If I, if I, or they, left they left briefly, yeah. and then they came back, yeah. yeah. They were away for a while. They actually went to, to the States. To, they were in L.A. for a while. Right, that's what yeah. I thought. I thought that he was in, LA, in, in Hollywood for a little yeah, while. Yeah, didn't like it. Kicking around. <laughs> yeah, I don't think... It wasn't a Brecht town, yeah. you know? <laughs> Hollywood of the, of the 40s and 50s was into the distancing effect of, <laughs> yeah, of exactly. Brecht. Yeah, exactly. They're um, like, what? But what, what is that like to sort of have a family member like that who's not just someone who was in theater and writing plays and, you know... And not just even like one of the greatest playwrights, but a very specific kind of playwright, you know? There, there is sincerity and emotion in his plays, but he crafted and sort of created a completely different model for storytelling in the theater that was about, forgive me if I'm wrong, it's been a little while, but you know, the distancing effect to make sure that people were also sort of analyzing the text while at the same time, yeah. same time feeling it. I mean, that's a completely different model, I think, than like, you know, a, a, a one woman show. I'm curious if there was a part of you that had to kind of get over that a little bit. Uh, no, not really. I mean, I think that when you, you know, obviously as a kid, you take it for granted if you grow up in a family with well-known people or people that have been influencers or great artists. I think it was later that I then realized like, wow, okay, I want to do theater. I want to be in theater and, and be in this world too. Um, and that I spent more time with the legacy. But um, I think that there's a lot of what I do um, is Brechtian because um, I do break that fourth wall and I do, you know, the characters I do are very heightened um, and sometimes almost cartoonish. And I think that has a lot of the distance, distancing effect um, in a new way, in a you know, comedic way. But I think that somehow I'm recycling things consciously and subconsciously that, that um, have been influenced on me by, by my family and my heritage. But yeah, my dad's a playwright too, you know, and I grew up in that world and, and all of it was kind of part of our fabric. So a lot of it is just kind of innate to me. Yeah. yeah. You have this other project going on right now. You are the voice in a in a video game, this yeah. massive video game. What's <laughs> going video on there? Game. Um, I don't know what is happening. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, it's called Overwatch, and I'm the voice of Mercy. She's a healer. Her catchphrase is, "Heroes never die." <laughs> um, and <laughs> she resurrects people. She's awesome. I love her. I'm so happy that I'm Mercy. I get to be Mercy. Yeah, it's huge. It's blown up. Um, and did you expect it? Did you? Did they? Did they have any idea that it would blow up like that? I think they did. I didn't. I was pretty oblivious. Um, I told my mother about it. Who? is, you know, a Brecht descendant and doesn't know anything about video games. And I was like, and her catchphrase is, heroes never die. And then, like, two weeks later, she asked me to do her a favor, like, post something on Facebook for her or something. And she wrote me a text message saying, thank you so much, you're a hero, and they never die. <laughs> yeah, close enough. That's close oh, to the catchphrase. I was like, oh, my God, it's infiltrated my family. But, um, no, I had no idea. I remember the first session when, when I recorded, the director said to me, you know, this is going to be a pretty big deal. Do you know that? And I was like, no, I don't. I have no clue. Did you think he was being mm. arrogant or were you? <laughs> no, I was like, oh, great. You know, that sounds good. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Like a very New Yorker kind of answer. Like, oh, yeah, really? Well, you know, 
when it when it blows up, you know, I'll believe it. But uh, <laughs> senior at NYU, whose student film I did, told me that too. And that <laughs> exactly, <didn't... laughs> me too. Is that the same film? Um, yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's blown up. It's great. The fans are amazing. It's been a wild ride so far. Um, I'm starting to do conventions. You know, uh, I got recognized by a waiter in a cafe the other day, and I thought he was gonna kick me out for not eating. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry, this is really unprofessional. But in my head, I was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to tell him I waited tables for five years. And how dare he? And I'm like having this whole conversation in my head, <laughs> you know, this whole comeback um, planned. And then I just hear him go, I'm a really big fan of your work. And I was like, what? <laughs> You're not kicking me out? Oh, OK. <laughs> but yeah, it's been it's But been you're wild. the voice of a video game character. How does he know who you? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, we, we have these, we um, have done these little videos, me and some other uh, voice actors from the game, where we do silly stuff, and we meet up. And so I think that's what uh, he recognized me from. Oh, cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get some questions uh, from the audience. Who's a question right here? Hi. Hi. So uh, I, I just love your personality, how you're just so <laughs> excited and, and stuff like that. And so I, I love how you were talking about David Hasselhoff and how, you, you know, he's, he is pretty great. So have you ever met him? And if you haven't, what would you fantasize your first interaction with him to be like? Ooh. <laughs> Naked and afraid. No. Um, <laughs> I have not met him. I kind of, I want to meet him, but I don't want to meet him, you know, because I don't want my David Hasselhoff bubble to burst. Uh, if I would meet him, I would say, David, um, ich liebe dich und danke. That's what I would say. <laughs> uh, next question. Hi, Lucy. Thank you for being here. Um, so I love the idea of one man, one woman shows. I think they're so impressive. Uh, what was the most challenging thing for you, um, you know, writing and performing in these? Um, cool. That's a great question. The most challenging thing was believing that anybody would care, I think, you know, um, because when you write about your own life, it's... <laughs> it's scary because you're putting a lot out there at the same time. Um, I was always very afraid of being self-indulgent or, you know, just getting up in front of people and, and people sitting there and going, why should I care? I have my own problems, you know? So um, that was the most challenging thing, believing in it and, and just like going out there, trying it out, doing it, and then seeing that it resonates with people was the most rewarding thing at the same time. I think we have time for one more question right here. Hi, Lucy. Hi. So you've done film, TV, and even video games and stand-up. So I was wondering if you have a favorite or a preference or if you'd like to try a new medium in the future. Uh, yes, baking. Um, <laughs> I like them all. Uh, they're all great. Uh, when you write your own material and then you do movies or TV, it kind of feels a little bit like a vacation because you're like, oh, I didn't even have to write anything. I just have to show up and do it. Uh, but it's all different and thrilling and great. So I would, tr I would like to um, do more singing. So yeah, a different medium. Maybe I'll, I'll get more into that as time goes by. But for now, the show, Hi Hitler, is at the Cherry Lane Theater July 11th yes. through the 30th, right? And people yep. can pick up tickets at uh, HiHitlerShow.com. That's right. Or awesome. at CherryLaneTheater.org as well. Ovation ticks. Yeah, just tweet me. <laughs> She'll just send you the Do tickets it. personally. Exactly. Lucy Paul, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you so Lucy. much. Thank you.